Chapter 4 In the first quiet moment of the day, Han's comlink unit chirped at him. Han, this is Luke, a familiar voice said. Will you come see me? What? Luke? Hey, kid, your sister's been looking everywhere for you. I know, Luke said. Will you come see me? Alone? Uh, all right. Where are you? Are you really on Karaskin, like Leia says? Luke did not answer directly. Take your speeder due west from Imperial City. When you reach the coast, turn off your nav system and release the controls. I'll bring you here. Well, okay. That's easy enough, but it'll have to be later, Han said apologetically. Tonight, somebody's got to watch the kids. Of course. I'll see you tonight. Wait, Han said quickly, before Luke could break the link. Is this supposed to be a secret? Can I tell Leo where I'm going? If you need to. I don't want you to lie to her. You sure you don't want to just call her yourself? Talk to her? I'm sure. Luke said. Tell her what you need to, but please come alone. The shore of the Western Sea had been a glittering playground, a gay and glorious world that never slept before the Clone Emperor's Force Storm had ravaged Coruscant. It had yet to fully recover. Only the lights of a few scattered resorts marked the broken lines of the coast as Han's speeder flashed overhead and bored into the dark sky over the western sea. Han waited several long seconds until he realized he couldn't say what exactly he was waiting for. Okay, Luke. Hope you're listening, wherever you are. I really don't want to go swimming tonight. Leaning forward, Han reached out and switched off the nav system, a process that took three confirmations and two overrides. A third of the speeder's cockpit controls went dark, while a bright orange legend across the bottom of the view shield warned manual flight mode. Here goes nothing, Han said with a sigh, sitting back and crossing his arms over his chest. Almost immediately, the speeder veered sharply right and dived toward the water. It was all Han could do to stop himself from grabbing the controls again. But the speeder soon leveled off, though at an alarmingly low altitude. The moon was still well below the horizon, but Han could see the undulating surface of the sea by the pale phosphorescent light of millions of tiny creatures riding the swells and currents. The sight was eerie and marvelous, but it was also barely an arm's length below the flat underside of the speeder and racing by at a dizzying clip. Hey, Luke, you out there? Han said, slouching as much as the speeder's seat and his long legs would allow. Is this going to be a long flight? Do I have time for a nap? Hey, pal, you can start food service any time. There was no response. Lousy space lines, Han muttered, closing his eyes. They're all smiles till they have your money and heard you on board. Then see if you can get a glass of water. A long-winged sea shrike rose from the rocks to fly in formation with Han's speeder as, slowing, it arrowed toward the beach. Wakened by the change in the pitch of the speeder's thrusters, Han strained to make out where it might be headed. Then a hole opened in the sky ahead a brightly lit oval that hung above the beach like a doorway to morning. The sea shrike veered off, and the speeder coasted through the oval of light and settled on the floor of an otherwise empty, high-ceilinged chamber. Han twisted sideways in his seat to see where he had come from, just in time to watch the opening seal itself behind him. Hello, Han, a voice said in his mind. Come up. Come up? Han said, scrambling out of the speeder. There's no... As he began his protest, the nearest wall deformed into a ladder, and an opening appeared in the ceiling above it. Sure, Han said. 
As if it would have been any more trouble to make stairs. But he reached out and clambered up the rungs all the same, taking them two at a time as a point of pride. He wasn't happy, though, to hear his own grunts at the bottom or feel his heart racing at the top. Han found himself standing at the bottom of a large, spherical room containing no furniture or technology, at least none that he could spot. Now what? Keep coming, said the voice in his head. Walk up the wall. Easy for you to say, Han said, starting to feel annoyed. But the opening he had climbed through had already vanished, leaving him with little choice. He started up the curving wall and found to his surprise that wherever he stood seemed to be the bottom of the sphere. There was no telling whether it was a trick with grav fields, some sort of Jedi ledger domain, or the room itself was turning under him. Han tried not to think about it though his steps became cautious as he went past the halfway point up the wall, or at least what should have seemed like halfway up the wall. After he had gone a dozen more tentative steps, a section of the floor, wall, ceiling, ahead of him, dropped away to form a ramp leading out of the sphere. It seemed to Han as though he must be upside down in relation to the rest of the structure, but he found himself apparently right side up, entering a large, pyramidal room from one of its three sloping sides. It was as lacking in amenities as any space he had seen so far, and lit by the same curious uniform glow that seemed to come from behind the walls without making them bright to the eyes. The light was as cold as the air. Nice little treehouse, Han said, moving slowly toward the center of the room looking up at the apex of the chamber. And you've done a wonderful job of cutting down on clutter. I think you've taken the idea of concealed storage to a new level. You'll have to give Leia the name of your decorator. Thank you for coming, Han, a voice said behind him. It's good to see you. Han spun around and found Luke standing one long stride away, almost as if he had been following Han. Han's face broke into a boyish, lopsided grin. Well, hey, I wanted to get out of the house, and since I was in the neighborhood. You know, you could have come to see us, too. No, I couldn't, Luke said. He wore an ankle-length patchwork robe that seemed to be made from bits of several other garments, including a pilot's uniform and a Tatooine sand cape. His demeanor was relaxed but remote quelling Han's impulse to grab him in a bear hug and clap him on the back. I hope by the time you leave, you'll understand why. Well, you'll have to start at the beginning, because I don't understand a thing about what's going on, Han said. What is this place? Why are you here? Why are you hiding? Why am I here? Why didn't you want Leia to come? Leia wants something from me, Luke said. You don't. Your other questions will take longer to answer. Han looked around with a frown. If this is going to be a long conversation, I don't suppose you have anything like a chair anywhere. Sorry, Luke said, dropping gracefully into a cross-legged meditation posture. Sit where you like and I'll put an air cushion under you. He waited until Han was comfortably settled, then went on. As you see, I can hide well enough, even from Leia. But I'd rather be left alone. I hope that you'll go back and ask her to accept that. If she doesn't, well, she's not going to get what she wants. She's only going to drive me away from Kurustal. I don't get it, Han said. Why? You two have always been close. What happened? Nothing, Luke said. I just can't be close with anyone right now. Go on, I'm listening. Luke nodded, but looked down into his lap before continuing. I don't know if you can understand or not. When I first met Obi-Wan, he'd been a hermit on Tatooine for ten years or more. When I first met Yoda, he had been a hermit on Dagobah for a hundred years or more. I never thought to ask either of them why. 
a little late for that now, Han said with a wry smile. At the time, I assumed they were both in hiding, hiding from the Emperor, from my father. But that makes no sense. No, nothing personal, but hiding from that pair makes great sense to me. I can think of a couple of times I'd have been glad to do it if I could have. But why in the middle of a desert or a jungle? Eh, uh, isn't that obvious? No, Luke said, shaking his head. It's much easier for Han Solo to hide, even with a price on his head, than for a powerful Jedi, whether Knight or Dark Lord. A Jedi's physical presence is only a small portion of his connection to the universe. Change his face, hide him from sight, and I'll still feel his presence when he draws on the Force. It doesn't matter if he's in the next room or across the system. Remember when we were taking the stolen shuttle to Endor to destroy the second Death Star shield? Yeah, Han said. You were pretty jumpy. You said Vader could sense you. He did sense me, Luke said. I didn't have the skill yet to make the waters still. But Obi-Wan and Yoda were masters. If they can hide from the Emperor, and I believe they could, why they could as easily hide in Imperial City or on Vader's own Star Destroyer as anywhere. And if their skills weren't equal to Palpatine's, neither distance nor isolation could save them from being discovered. Maybe they hid out in the sticks so no one else would get hurt if Vader showed up, Han suggested. You've got to admit, when you guys fight, it has a way of getting messy. We've got a few monuments to that fact downtown in Imperial City. Luke shook his head. No, I discovered the real reason while I was on Yavin. The dilemma that every Jedi eventually faces. I discovered a very important and difficult truth, Han. A frustrating truth. The stronger you become in the Force, the more that you can do, the more that's expected of you, and the less your life belongs to you. Is this the answer then? Han said, gesturing at the room with one hand. Running away? Call it that if you must. It's one answer. There's another, even less appealing, Luke said. Han, I'm convinced that for each Jedi, there comes a point at which he or she must choose. When the world presses in on you, threatens to drive you mad, there are only two ways you can find peace. One is to impose your will on everyone and everything around you. The other is to surrender your will, your ego, and withdraw from those who are always wanting you to fix their lives. I don't see it, Han said stubbornly. Luke smiled. Try to imagine that you're at home. One of the children is screaming and the other two are tugging at your elbows, each demanding that you punish the other for some slight... Routine, Han said. Chewbacca is playing tree drum music at ear-splitting levels. C-3PO is nattering on about nothing. R2-D2 is behind your chair, arguing with the household droids in basic. The hypercom is blaring two channels at once, both too loudly. Your comm link is chirping in your pocket. You have three messages from people who want you to come do them a favor, and Leia's insisting on your attention. Lando has a raucous sabac game going on in the next room, there's someone at the front door, and a flight of airspeeders keeps buzzing right over your head. Okay, that'd be a little worse than routine, Han conceded. A little. Now imagine it goes on around the clock for a day, ten days, a month, half a year, a year, not only without a break, but getting worse all the time, until you reach your limit, whatever your limit might be. What are your choices? Control your environment, or leave it? Or go mad and destroy it, Han said, which hardly counts as a choice. Yeah, I think I get the picture now. Do you see what a thin line separates Palpatine and Yoda? Luke said in it. Palpatine sought power over others. Yoda sought power from within. Palpatine wanted control of everything, in the hopes of building what he thought would be a perfect universe. Yoda gave up the idea of controlling or perfecting the universe in the hopes of understanding it. You know, Han said slowly, I always kind of wondered why you drew the short straw. 
why Yoda and Obi-Wan didn't team up and take on the Emperor themselves. Yes, Luke said, his face more animated than Han had seen it since arriving. I think that's why it fell to me, Han. Huh? That's why I had to be the one to face Vader. I still had the passion to reshape things, a passion Obi-Wan and Yoda had moved beyond. Surrender disarms you. Han's expression showed his disgust. It's pretty useless then, isn't it? Jedi Knights who won't fight? Han, try to understand you. The essence of the dark side is using the Force to control others. I know that temptation firsthand. If you champion that idea, you're thinking just as Palpatine and my father did. I have the power and it's mine to use as I wish. Do you want that to be the code we live by? Should the Jedi rule the galaxy simply because we can? Well, now that you put it that way. Good, Luke said. But then understand that there's a price. When a Jedi renounces that path, it becomes very hard to be a warrior to lead a crusade. Obi-Wan and Yoda weren't afraid to fight or to die. They felt the suffering the Empire was causing just as acutely as any of us did, probably more so. I wasn't stronger than them or wiser. I was raw, headstrong, reckless. But I had to be the one to challenge the Emperor, because I still could. Han frowned and cocked his head. What about now? Now? I don't know. Luke said, shaking his head. I don't know if I could do it now. I don't know if I could summon the outrage. I feel myself standing on a dividing line, at a cusp. I don't know what I should be doing with these gifts, these burdens. It's the question I've come here to explore. And you want to be left alone to do it? I need to be, Han. Will you help Leia understand? I can try, Han said dubiously. I can't ask more than that. Um, look, with everything you've said, I already know the answer. But I gotta ask, so I can tell her again. Leia wants your help with something. I know. She wants you to come live with us for a while. She needs help with the kids. She thinks she does, Luke said. I'm sorry. I have to say no. Okay, Han said with a shrug. I had to ask. I guess she thought, you know, family and all. Maybe you could become a hermit next month instead of this month. Luke stood. She's important to me, as are the children, as are you. You know that. Sure. That's why my answer is no. It has nothing to do with his other matter. It doesn't? Han asked, struggling to his feet. My sister Leia has all the talent and wisdom she needs to be not only the mother, but the model your children need, Luke said. She has only to believe in herself, and she'll find that nothing is beyond her. Which is why the worst thing I could do for your family right now is come to her rescue to encourage her to look to me to solve her problems. She'll only undercut her own authority with the children and yours with it. They must learn their first and most important lessons from you. In that, they're no different from any other children. Han pursed his lips as he considered Luke's answer. All right, he said, offering his hand. Good luck, Luke. I hope this won't be the last time I see you. But you call us. We won't call you. Okay, buddy? Taking the offered hand, Luke looked intently into his visitor's eyes. Thank you, he said with a small but affectionate smile. I couldn't ask for a better friend than you are. As always, the open emotion made Han uncomfortable. You could ask, but you don't deserve one, he wisecracked, patting Luke on the arm and then pulling away. He circled around Luke toward where the chamber's entrance used to be. You get right to work moving that metal furniture around, or whatever it is you hermits do. I'll just go home and tell Leia you've cracked up. It'll be a lot simpler. No, don't bother. I can find my way out. I never have seen a maze that couldn't be greatly simplified with a good blaster.
The golden sheen of the droid's metal skin made a brilliant contrast to the tangle of broad green leaves and dangling vines through which he was noisily making his way. Impossible! Such arrogance! The droid sat aloud as he struggled with the thick growth, though he did not yet know there was an audience for his thoughts. For all he listens to me, you would think that he is the protocol droid and I the astromech. Flailing his arms at a snarl of branches blocking his way, the golden droid stopped and looked back the way he had come. I hope the stone bats rip out your circuits and nest in your equipment bays, he called into the jungle. I hope a kite hawk drags you off to the temples and feeds you to her kits. It would just serve you right. But when he turned back to consider his own plight, the droid found his way blocked not only by the flora of Yavin 4, but by a tall, broad-shouldered man in a military flight suit. Oh! C-3PO exclaimed, and fell back a step. General Calrissian, you startled me, sir. Where did you come from? Lando grinned. With all the noise you were making, a platoon of stormtroopers could have snuck up and startled you. Don't tell me you're still fighting with R2 after all this time. You two are worse than brothers. That stubborn, contrary pile of tin is no brother to me, 3PO said with stiff pride. If I had been as carelessly constructed as he was, I would return myself to my maker to be scrapped. In all my years, I've never met another R unit as erratic and egotistical as R2-D2. A simple rebuild of the secondary power grid, and R2 turns it into a major project. I could give you a list of his operational anomalies as long as... That will have to wait, said Lando. Right now you need to pack your polish and power couplings. You're coming with me on a little trip. Sir, I would be most delighted to accompany you. For all I care, R2 can fall in a mud bog and rust away. 3PO said, extracting himself from the snarl of vines and circling a tree to join Lando. But Master Luke brought me here to manage the administrative needs of the Academy, and he did not change those instructions before he left. What did he say when he left? Not a word to either of us, General Calrissian. He simply vanished in the night. I have not heard from him, or of him, in nineteen local days. Do you have news of Master Luke, sir? Is he well? Do you bring new instructions from him? Lando pursed his lips and considered. Yes, I do, 3PL. New instructions for the both of you. Luke's fine, but he's gone off on some sort of retreat, and he's assigned you to the fleet office until he returns. And the fleet office has assigned you to me. If I could have found Luke to ask him, I'm sure the end result would have been the same, Lando told himself. I am glad to hear that Master Luke is well, General Calrissian. No one has been able to tell me anything, and I will not miss Yavin 4. It is so human here that my circuits are always corroding. Look at me. I can't go into the jungle without getting filthy. But must we take R2 with us? I am afraid so, old man, Lando said, patting the droid's metallic shoulder. But look at it this way. You only have to deal with R2. I have to deal with the both of you. If I can cope, so can you. 3PO tipped his head back, and his eyes flashed. Sir, I don't understand. I'll explain later, Lando said, glancing at his chrono. Call R2 in. We've got a deadline to beat, and this isn't our last stop. I will have to inform Master Streen of our departure. Already taken care of, Lando said, thinking of a different set of lies he had just told to Strain. Still can't get used to being trusted. It's a better camouflage than I thought. Come on, Tin Man. Lady Lux waiting for us. Coppery clouds rich in oxides of type banagas churned outside the view panes of what had once been Lando Calrissian's office in Bespin's Cloud City. Inside as outside, nothing had changed since the last time he had seen it. 
The walls and shelves were heavily laden with the eclectic collection of objects that only a rich man or a well-traveled smuggler could amass. I like what you've done to the place, Lando said to the cyborg that sat behind what had once been Lando's desk. I guess I never did get around to sending for my things, eh? I don't mind, said Lobot. The activity lights on the interface band he wore from ear to ear were flickering busily. You have better judgment in subjective matters than I do. The calculus of room decoration still eludes me. Well, at least you have the good taste to recognize my good taste, Lando said with a grin. Still, a man can get tired of the same surroundings day after day, no matter how splendid they are. When's the last time you got yourself out of here for a while? I go out on inspection walks twice a day, Lobot said. It takes 97 days to complete an inspection schedule. Let me put it another way. How long has it been since you broke your connection to Cloud City? A puzzled expression flashed briefly across the cyborg's face. I have never broken my connection to the administrative interface. Just as I suspected, Lando said. And exactly why I'm here. Lobot... You work too hard. You're long overdue for a change of scenery, a vacation. How can I leave Cloud City without an administrator? Lobot, I have a secret to tell you. The people who work for you will enjoy the novelty. Lobot frowned. But systems will randomize without monitoring and supervision. Then think about how much fun you'll have putting them right when you get back, Lando said. And the trip will do you good, too. Frankly, you could use a little practice in conversation. Am I still the only one around here who knows you can talk? Direct input is more efficient. Efficiency is overrated, my friend, Lando said, sitting back in his chair and crossing his legs, ankle over knee. Come on, what do you say? Knowing how much you like to work, I cooked up a vacation where there'll be plenty of work for you to do. What sort of work? I can't tell you unless you say yes, Lando said, tapping the insignia on his uniform. I've got a temporary commission in my pocket and the security clearance to go with it. All I can promise you is problems a lot more interesting than the ones you're working on now. And I really could use your help. It'll be like old times. Lobot stood, looking slowly about the room. I'll trade you my help for your things, he said finally. I want them to stay. For old times. Why, you old horse trader, you. Who's been teaching you the art of the finagle? You did, Lobot said. He closed his eyes and lowered his chin to his chest. The lights on his interface bar all flashed green, then all flashed red, then went dark. Raising his head, he opened his eyes and looked at Lando. It's too quiet. Go ahead and leave a few channels open, then. Lando said, standing. Bring with you whatever you need to be comfortable. A few scattered lights on Lobot's interface sprang back into activity. Better, he said. Let's go. What is my rank? What problems need solutions? I'll tell you all about it on the way. The Telchcon Task Force, seven vessels in all, had gathered in orbit around the sixth planet of the Coruscant system, where it would not so readily attract attention. Lady Locke was the last to join them, and the smallest ship among them, save for a pilotless intelligence ferret. Lando's yacht was dwarfed by Pakpakat's command ship, the Cruiser Glorious, I don't like the looks of that heavy artillery, Lando said, sizing up the situation from Lady Luck's cockpit. I thought we were being sent to outsmart our quarry, not outgun it. The fact that the Vagabond disabled a frigate with apparent ease may have dictated the choice of a cruiser, Lobot said. I'm sure it did, Lando agreed. I just don't like the way things are shaping up. He reached for the comm unit. This is General Lando Calrissian, aboard the Lady Luck, hailing the Glorious. Request permission to come aboard. General Calrissian, sir, said a young-sounding voice. This is Lieutenant Harona, officer of the day. 
We've been expecting you, sir. Would you like us to send out the captain's boat? I'm afraid there's been some misunderstanding, Lieutenant. I'm not looking for a ride in. I'm looking for parking space on your flight deck. There was a static-filled pause, which ended when Hirona cleared his throat. General Calrissian, I'm afraid you're right. There has been some confusion. Our flight decks are filled with mission gear and our own baby birds. There's no room for Lady Luck in board. Then make room, Lieutenant. Unless you were planning for our best speed to be your convoy speed. Lando thumbed the mute switch and added to Lobot. Now we'll find out if they know how fast my little ship really is. The second pause was longer. Sir, Colonel Pakpakant suggests that you come aboard, Glorious, and let a relief crew ferry your yacht back to Coruscant. Aha, uh -huh, said Lando. That tells me that they've got it in their minds that I'm an observer. He released the mute switch. Lieutenant Harona, we have our own mission gear aboard. Do I understand you to say Colonel Pakpakat is willing to hold here for another day or two while you set up secure holdings for file and equipment transfer? If so, put your quartermaster on and we'll start telling him what we'll need. Uh, no, sir. That would not be the Colonel's first choice. Lando winked at Lobot. Now I've got him, he thought. Lieutenant, maybe I should just talk to Colonel Potpacot directly. They could almost hear the O.D. squirming. Sir, the Colonel is very busy at the moment with pre-departure matters. I'm sure he is. Tell you what, Lieutenant, I can solve your little problem for you without disturbing the Colonel. I see that your number five external dock is open. You pull that cap and we'll hook on there. General Calrissian, I'm very sorry, but I can't authorize that. Then why are you wasting my time, Lieutenant? Lando said sharply. Go get your senior officer and put him on the line. I want to talk to someone who can make a decision. And when we're finished with our business, which should take about two minutes, I'm going to ask him to conduct a review of his bridge procedures and staff. I want him to find out why a flag officer and the fleet operations delegation to this mission were kept waiting while the officer of the day thumbed through the manual for a regulation to follow. The subsequent silence was the longest yet. Lady Luck, number five external hard dock will be ready momentarily. Prepare for auto docking. Thank you, Lieutenant, said Lando. Lady Luck, how? Well done, sir, 3PO gushed. That seems like an excellent compromise. Compromise nothing. I got what I really wanted, Lando said, starting the auto-docking sequence and climbing out of the pilot seat. I wasn't about to give up my ship, and I didn't want it locked up inside where I'd need their permission to use it. Then you achieved all your objectives, Lobot said. Oh no, we're just beginning. Now we have to re-educate them about our role on this mission, Lando said. Get ready to disembark. I'm going to need all of you on this. Colonel Pakpakant, sir. General Calrissian to see you. The ensign's voice was a bit shrill with nervousness. Lando guessed that he had never been on the combat bridge before, or had reason to speak to the mission commander, if he had seen him at all. The ensign had been the first member of the crew Lando saw after ducking through the inner airlock of Number 5 dock, and he had commandeered the young technician to escort them to Colonel Pakpakan. Lando was familiar with the layout of the Belarus class star cruiser and could have hazarded a guess as to where Pakpakat could be found. But being escorted with his entourage following at his heels allowed him to make an entrance. Several heads swiveled at the ensign's announcement, but most turned immediately back to their duties after taking in the new arrivals with a glance. The exception was a two-meter-tall Hortek, whose bony armor plates were a ruddy brown in the bridge's combat lighting. His long neck twisted toward the group standing by the bridge's aft blast door, and the intense gaze from his unblinking eyes was nearly hypnotizing. Curse you. Drayson, you could have told me he was a Hortek, Lando thought reflexively. But after that, he guarded his thoughts as best he could. 
Besides being one of the few predator species in the New Republic, the Hortak have the reputation of being telepathic, not only with their own kind, but, to an unknown degree, with a number of other species as well. It was an intimidating combination. General, Pakpakat said, curtly acknowledging Lando. His gaze flicked to Lobot and the droids. Who are these people? C-3PO stepped forward smartly. Sir, I am C-3PO. Human cyborg relations. I am fluent in over six million... Shut up, Pakpakat said sharply. Yes, sir, 3PO said, retreating behind Lobot. Lando stepped forward. Colonel Pakpakat, this is my staff. I'd be happy to make introductions, but I have some late updates for you which perhaps ought to have our attention first. Is your ready room available? Pakpakat held his head high, studying Lando. Reaching into my mind, you and I need to talk, and no one else here needs to hear what we say. Pakpakat lifted a hand in the direction of the ready room door. Captain, continue with preparations for departure, he said. The moment the door wrapped privacy around them, Pakpakat drew threateningly close to Lando. So, he said, you're the man who browbeat my officer of the day. Don't expect to do the same to me. Lando smiled and opened up the distance between them again by slipping into a chair. I wouldn't even try, Colonel, he said, adopting a relaxed posture. Nor would I expect to need to. We're here with the same goal, working for the same people, Princess Leia, the Senate, the Republic. Pakpakat made a sharp barking sound, the Hortek equivalent of a grunt. I was told to wait for an observer from Fleet Command. Nothing was said about staff. Why should anything need to be said? Do you go anywhere without your aides? Asked Lando, gesturing with both hands. My staff has technical expertise, which very well may be the difference between success and failure for this mission. We have five protocol droids on board, all E-series or newer, Pot Bacot said. Yours are superfluous. On the contrary, I consider my staff indispensable, Lando said, and I expect them to be extended every consideration due me as the fleet officer's field operative for this mission. Pakpakat moved closer, looming over Lando. Operative. Now that's a curious word, General. Were you led to believe that you'd have an active part in the conduct of the mission? Were you led to believe otherwise? I have been assigned to recover the Teljkan Vagabond, Pakpakat said. I have no instructions about sharing my command or that responsibility with you. I don't want to share your command, Colonel. All I want is mutual cooperation. After all, the fleet officer's interests in this matter are at least equal to the intelligence service's interests, Lando said. We were the ones who nearly lost a frigate to the Vagabond. Then you should understand that this is an extremely sensitive matter. We have no idea what we may find out there. Colonel... If we find anything of value out there, it's not going to belong to either one of us, Lando said, flashing his vast conciliatory smile. Unless you simply don't trust the fleet office, there's no reason we can't work together toward a common goal. Pakpakat loosed an eerie chittering sound, which caused a chill to run down Lando's back. What are you asking? No more than you would. Run of the ship full and timely access to tactical data, consultation on strategy, and if and when we board her, include us in. Only that. That's it. All other command prerogatives remain yours. I see, Pakpakat said. All we need do to keep you happy is take you along on the most sensitive part of the mission and one for which you're completely unprepared. Now, Colonel, do you take me for wounded prey? the Hortek demanded, showing his teeth. We are prepared to assemble an assault team, tailored to whatever challenges the Vagabond presents. I am not prepared to assemble one based on who thinks it would be fun to go along. Do you have a lockpick? What? 
You said you're ready for anything, Lando said. But it's been my experience that when someone in uniform says that, he really means we have little guns, we have big guns, we have bombs of all sizes. There are other ways to get past a locked door. Are you as ready to pick a lock as you are to blow one up? As ready to wheedle as you are to demand? As ready to coax as to capture? If not, you'd better think again about how ready you really are. My tactical team has over fifty years' intelligence experience. Listen, Colonel, Lando said, coming to his feet and thrusting his face close to the Hortec. I'm sure you have good, solid veteran players on your team. But I've got some ringers on mine. I've got a human with a machine interface, a droid with a universal linguistic interface, and a droid with a universal machine interface. There is nothing special about your staff's abilities. Maybe not in the specs, said Lando, but they know how to play together. And they know how to win. We beat Darth Vader and we beat the Emperor on their turf and on their terms. Ancient history. And you were lucky. Lando smiled. Any gambler knows you don't bet against a lucky man. If you keep my players out of the game and you lose, you're going to have a hard time explaining that to the people who sent us out here. A commander's burden. I wouldn't want yours right now, Lando said. Look, Colonel. No matter who or what's inside the Vagabond, we have to be able to outthink them. Because if we don't, we lose both ways. If we have to destroy that ship, or it has to destroy us, I am very aware of that. Lando pointed toward the door. Well, that's R2-D2 and C-3PO out there. Luke Skywalker's personal droids. And Lobot and I made a living making fools of security and intelligence in one system after another. We've beaten tricks your people haven't even thought of yet. How sure are you that you don't want us on your team? Pak Pakat's nostrils flared. And then he bowed his neck, the Hortec counterpart to a nod of agreement. Very well. We will work together. Good. That's all I want, Lando said. I do not believe that. I know who you are, Pak Pakat said with a menacing stiffness. Do not think I do not. I will be watching you. Lando kept his mind clear. We're going to get along just fine, Colonel. You'll see.